Good morning and happy Sabbath to everyone. I don't know what kind of week you have had, but today hopefully you can find some rest in the arms of Jesus. I would invite all of you to stand as we sing our opening song, Power in the Blood. You be free from the burden of sin. There's power in the blood. way to start our service. We need some power, power, wonder, working power. It's great to see everyone here today. You're in the right place, and we are going to worship the Lord today. We'd like to welcome those that are viewing with us online. We've had some glitches with our YouTube, but I think things are figured out now, and um, we're able to continue to worship together on YouTube. So who knew? that we would get to do that. Uh, I want to welcome anyone that is here as a guest. I know we have some special guests here today, and you are welcome to be here. We want you to feel like this is home, and we want you to feel like you can come back at any time, and we will have our arms open and a spot filled or waiting for you to fill it. Uh, following the service today, there's a fellowship luncheon just across the way, and uh, that today is by Gladys Sosa and her team. So we thank them in advance. Usually great food, like all the luncheons are. But today, um, it's nice to get together and socialize since it's kind of dreary outside. And because of that, Aaron and Shannon have said no to the family hike today. So if you're brave enough, you brought your stuff, you want to hike anyway, you have at it but Aaron and Shannon are tapping out for this one. But tonight at 6.30, there's a social in our fellowship hall, and it's a board game social, and we can't let Charlene down because she has no idea what that looks like or how that could be fun. So she was up last week telling us about it. Everyone planned to come. You can bring a board game if you really have one that you are anxious to play. And uh, she has a couple of details that she's going to share with us at this point, and we may or may not have her assistance as well. Okay, so we're really excited. Have you set your board games aside already? I hope so. So that's happening tonight, but I also want to give you a heads up for next month because the team is so great, they've planned next month already. Who likes to paint? 
So we're going to have a very posh, using my British language, a very posh paint and sip night next month. And we have just confirmed that we will have robust childcare, thank you, over here, so that the parents can paint in peace, sip your fancy, um, fancy cocktails, non-alcoholic of course, um, and we're gonna have really good food, but I need numbers for that so that we can plan the posh accessories. Um, so I think we can send out an email or um, about what, what my number is, and I'd like if you could just RSVP with, we're hoping to, even if it's just we're hoping to, okay, so that we can plan for you. We don't want to not cater for you. So there's fun tonight, and there's even more fun coming next month also. We love our kids in this church. We, we like to uh, encourage them to become leaders. So when there's an opportunity for them to come up and show a face for a moment, we support that. So thank you, Charlene. Paint and sip sounds great. So watch for that email and make sure you RSVP for that. But make sure you come tonight, 6.30. And if you have any questions about next month's social, you can also ask Charlene about that tonight. Vespers and dinner tonight, 6.30. Thank you. Yes, plan to be there. But next Sabbath, we have the long-awaited event of Don McClafferty, and Kathy is going to come up as well as Cindy, and they're going to share with us a couple of quick details about that. And come on over here. Happy Sabbath, church. We have... Um, a wonderful testimony by Kathy today. Um, last, was it three weeks ago, we had our prayer vigil. It was the first time I had met Kathy, and we were walking into the fellowship hall, and you were a little nervous. You were like, I don't know what to expect here, and we were meeting for the first time. And can I just ask you, um, were you a little uncomfortable? Um, not too much, but... <clears throat> excuse me. Um, I am new here to this church, so I didn't know anybody, and um, that was part of the feeling uncomfortable. Yeah, and just didn't know what to expect either. I remember you said, I've never been to one of these. Right. I don't know what no, to expect. That's right. It yeah. Was, so it was well planned. Oh, praise the Lord. Yes. Well, I just wanted to, we received an email um, from you, Pastor Jeff shared it, and I just thought it'd be so lovely for those that were present for the whole church to hear what your experience was and what has happened since then. Okay. Um, so I just um, want to say um, I'm looking forward to getting to know all of you. Um, I'm somewhat new, so look forward to having some time to get to know you. Um, I just wanted to share these prayers that um, just to thank God <laughs> and to honor him for moving in real tangible ways um, quickly after we had this um, corporate prayer, this vigil. Um, I had three prayers um, one was for my family, uh, who struggles with addictions and very deep-seated trauma. The second one was for my dear friend Karen, who is very sick with stage 4 cancer. And the last one was for myself, of course, <laughs> for um, painful neuropathy, which limits me in almost every way. Um, so um, I received three answers to prayers. <laughs> these prayers in particular. Um, the first one was my family. Um, about a week after the prayer vigil, I'm sorry, I'm nervous and I have to read this to <laughs> stay focused. <laughs> um, my son shared that he and his wife were basically on the road to recovery in so many words or less, but um, she's planning to go to AA, which is a miracle because she's an atheist. Um, and uh, very resistant to any kind of, um, of, of treatment or anything. Um, and my son is attending meetings. <laughs> um, Al-Anon, he's in denial, but anyway, <laughs> he's quit drinking, and um, they're both dry right now. Uh, this is a very vulnerable time, you know. Um, um, every day is vulnerable when you're an addict or alcoholic. So please, I ask for your prayers. What other um, names, Kathy? Um, and this is 
I know <laughs> this is a funny thing to say, but in strict confidence, I share this with you because it's I hope that they come here someday, Amen. right? Amen. <laughs> we'll lift but him up in my prayer. My son is James, and um, he was raised in the church. And my daughter-in-law is Jessica, and she was not raised in the church and has suffered much trauma in her life. So there's a lot of uh, walls to go through. Um, there, um, so anyway, um, God is working. God is, I mean, that's just not a coincidence, people. <laughs> that was like within a week. <laughs> Amen. Um, Amen. Of course, my grandson is the apple of my eye, and, and uh, we worry about our grandchildren as much as our children or more. And he's in the midst of an unhealthy environment. But uh, God is at work in his life, too, and I see that in big ways. The second one is Karen. Um, I began sharing the health message, the Seventh-day Adventist health message with Karen when she became ill um, back in November. Um, she had not been open to the vegetarian lifestyle, but she allowed me to try, <laughs> imparting some of it. And I've been juicing with her and applying the New Start prescription for health as she permits. And um, please do keep praying for Karen's health. But soon after the prayer vigil, I go see Karen almost daily. She's a neighbor. Um, I told her I recognized one of her doctors <laughs> here in this church, and that this doctor plays a beautiful violin and piano. And I just learned her husband plays cello. Well, Karen plays a beautiful violin, piano, and cello. And she's been to this church for the concert series, but um, she is a deep believer. Um, she's in hospice now at home, and I'm witnessing big changes in her demeanor after I told her about her physician <laughs> being a member here. And um, she told me just a couple days ago um, that she wanted to come to our church with me. Amen. And I, I just ask you, do you, you know, do you think this is coincidence or do you think this is a miracle? Um, I'm just, uh, she's a very strong Christian woman, deep, deep, spiritually wise and um, devoted, but she's very stubborn. <laughs> so for her to be open to coming to our church, well, keep praying, people. There might just be another miracle here for, for Karen. Amen. And then the neuropathy in uh, my feet. Well, soon after the prayer vigil, I found a newly upgraded pair of walking shoes that are really amazing, a big difference in my pain. And um, when, you, when your feet hurt all the time, just trying on shoes is painful. So um, I really think this was like co not a coincidence. And, um, you know, so I just praise God. Any little relief is I'm, I'm grateful to have. So Amen. I just used to be afraid to pray for something because I didn't believe that God was really going to answer my prayers, and then, then what? You know, then you make God look bad or what? So anyway, I just, I realized that living in doubt just really holds us back from receiving God's gifts. I want to thank everybody that was praying that night. Um, you know what? Corporate prayer, I think, is, is fantastic. So thank you so much. Amen. <laughs> Church, does God answer prayers? Yeah. God answers prayers. Kathy is a living testimony that God answers prayers. And the prayer that God really wants to answer for our lives is revival. He wants us to have a spiritual renewal in our lives. Renewal to study our Bibles. Renewals to pray for others. Renewals for us to pray so that we can see miracles like Kathy's seeing in her life. We can all be seeing these miracles in the lives of the people that we know in our sphere of influence. Like this church could be like busting at the seams because of people that we're praying for that want to join us now because we've prayed for them. So that is what this revival coming up next week is all about. It is about all of us coming and just catching that fire, catching what God wants to do in our lives as a result of our prayers and our asking him to fill us with his Holy Spirit. I wanted to share one final thought here. 
Well, I do want to read a quote, but I know it's getting long, so I'll, I'll skip on that. I just want to share one testimony. A really dear friend of mine, her husband, I mean, her, yeah, her husband is the treasurer for Michigan Conference, and she was at a leadership conference um, maybe three weeks ago, and she kept hearing this name, Don McLafferty, Don McLafferty, and so she talked to one of her friends who had just had Pastor Don McLafferty at their um, at their conference in Indiana and did a whole leadership conference and prayer session. And this woman just shared with her, it was so wonderful that that conference is never the same. She said, we're never going to be the same after this. You know, God really used this man. I don't know if you realize how special it is that he's coming here to Grass Valley. He's coming to us from doing a leadership training down at the Central California Conference with all their leaders. He's coming to us for just three, three, four days at the most, and then he's going off to another training out in Arkansas. I mean, he is on a circuit. So my girlfriend who heard this testimony has now gotten him to come to Michigan Conference to do um, a training there. So God is really using him, and the word is getting out. I'm praying you guys are going to have to come early because we are trying to make this a Grass Valley revival, but the word is spreading that Pastor Don McClafferty is coming, and I think we're going to have a full house. So I'm just telling our church family, come Come early. It starts at six, but if I were you, I'd come a little bit earlier because I think it's going to be uh, tight in there in the fellowship hall. So there's a light supper, very light supper. So at six o'clock. So come eat a lot if you need. If you're going to be hungry, come at six, and then we will start at six thirty. Thank you. <laughs> okay, you heard it. We don't want to miss out on that next week. So uh, the. Deacons were supposed to do their wood ministry tomorrow, and due to the weather, Joe has determined that it's best to postpone that. So we'll aim to do that next Sunday, the 21st. Uh, just a side note about one of our members as well, Pat Benso, a longtime member and dear sister, um, just really seeks our prayers. She has a lot of physical issues going on right now and is uh, temporarily living at Spring Hill Manor. So please keep her in your prayers. Um, we have VBS coming up June 17 to 21. That's our huge outreach and focus for our own young uh, kids and as well as our community kids. So be thinking about that. Um, and leading into that, we know we love our children here in this church. We have Echo Ridge that we love and support. And our teachers are here today to give us an update on Echo Ridge and tell us the highlights of what's happening there. Good morning, everyone. So, do we have a... No? Can we go to the next slide? So... We would like to share very quickly three goals that that are the center of Echo Ridge right now so that as you see us now and again, you know that these three things are the priority at our school. So the first one, there we go. Our first one, of course, is that our school is Christ-centered. And the reason for that is that we know we're teaching kids to be successful in life and to learn lots of academics, but the most important thing is that each child would learn about Jesus when they are at our school. We always tell them that having a relationship with God is more important than getting A's on every test. So if we can pray together and if we can um, read the Bible together and learn about God, then that is true success at our school. Secondly, we really love to include family on our trips and in our activities. Um, not only parents of the kids, but we also like to include a family spirit among the kids. So this year we've created three family groups that are with each teacher that include all different ages. So they're intermixed um, with different ages for about an hour every day where they can learn how to interact and how to help each other um, when they're all at different levels. And the things that we do during that hour in their group is to create rich experiences, um, doing projects together, which helps them apply what they've learned in the book to a real life scenario. So today you're gonna hear about our very first big project that we're doing this year, which we're super excited about. Yes, so as <clears throat> Alexis mentioned, we are split into family groups, three family groups. Um, we have been working on building a new sandbox for the school. So, the students had to make a proposal to the school 
that we would bring here to the church, which would include first, they had to design it themselves, and they had to research what would be a reasonable design. Of course, we had some kindergartners who would like it to float above the field, so we had to have some of the older kids uh, bring them down to reality and decide what is an actual model that we could make. So the students had to draw the design. They had to make a 3D model. They also had to come up with the exact dimensions. And using these dimensions, we could calculate the area of it and decide how much lumber we would use, what materials we would need to calculate the cost. And of course, we had to calculate how much sand would be in, finding the volume, and converting that into cubic yards. So there was a lot of math involved in this and a lot of research. So here we have their final design. It is a rectangular shape, oh, a rectangular shape, um, and it's going to include a volleyball net that can be taken up and down so it allows for two types of play. And they also decided, here's their 3D model, that they wanted to include some elements like umbrellas over there for shade and benches for people to sit at. And we decided to go out into the field to show you guys where it would be and what the actual dimensions are and so that the students could all experience, even the littlest ones, what those dimensions really mean in the field that itself. Okay, and we're going to hear a little bit more about that from the students themselves. Yes, so uh, we actually have some students from Echo Ridge this morning here with us, and we are going to do a very quick interview with them. So first, your names and the grade that you're in. I'm Joey, and I am in sixth grade. I'm Coda, and I'm in sixth grade. Awesome. So my first question for you guys is, what are you the most excited for about our new sandbox project? Just having a new area to play in at recess. A new game to play for PE, volleyball. Awesome. And this would be very important for our church family to know. What do you think we will need the most help with when making our sandbox? Making it structurally sound so that the sand doesn't seep out and bringing the supplies to the school. All right, well, you heard it here from our Echo Ridge students. Thank you guys so much. Um, yes, so if you look in your bulletin, there is help that is needed. Hmm? Yeah, there's a, note, there's a note in the bulletin about things that we'll need for um, the sandbox, and Alexis will tell us a little bit more about that. So this is where we'd like to call you guys to think of, is there anything you could contribute to this project? Um, of course, we're going to need some supplies. We've already had the sand donated, um, and we are going to need some lumber for this sandbox and just some gen general tools. So if there's maybe perhaps something that you have around that you wouldn't mind sharing with us, please contact us because that will help us out a lot, and the kids are also doing a fundraising project for this, um, which you may, you may hear about. They're going to be selling tulip bulbs and other flower bulbs um, that you could also help us out by um, participating in the fundraiser. The second thing, if supplies are not something you could help with, the second thing is if you could contribute by spending a little time with the kids and coming out when we're actually building and maybe helping them learn how to use those supplies or maybe just participating on the day that we put it all together, please let us know. We would love to have you come out and volunteer and help us put this project together. Thank you so much. Don't we love our teachers? Amen. We are doing something that we don't like to do, but know that it is a necessary evil of sorts, and that is we send two of our members off um, with our wishes and our blessings, and we ask for, um, I don't see them, but Michelle and Andy, oh, there you are, to come on up, and uh, we want to We want to pray you know, for them. We want to pray for you, and Shirley has, on behalf of the quilters, um, it has a quilt for the two of you. They are leaving us in this beautiful area for Idaho. Like, <laughs> whatever. I don't know. I but don't we know. know I like know. I say over and over, <laughs> that once you're a member here, you're always part of the family. And so we know that um, we will welcome you back at any time. Thank you. 
we do have a quilt we wanted to, to the, the church made for you. And so you always uh, stay warm up there because we know it gets cold. We'll need it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, good. It's favorite color. So this is for you, and we, we thank you for all the years that you've been. As many of you know, Andy's up in the, in the PA booth, and yep, PA booth is very, very thankful. And, um, and Michelle, we know you just lost your mom here, and you married your, your daughter, got married here, so there's memories here. Clayton has uh, been helpful and grown up here, so we'd like to pray for you. Oh, and we're leaving Clayton here. So. We're leaving Clayton, good. So please take care of him. Take care of Clayton. Yes. <laughs> Father in heaven, we just thank you for Andy and Michelle. We pray a blessing for these two as they head into the next chapter of their lives. It, it is grieving, Lord, and sad. To separate, we hold on to the hope of seeing once, seeing each other again in the new earth at the tree of life. In Jesus' name, we pray that you hold them close. Amen. Amen. Yeah, thank you. And now we'll move into our worship time, and uh, Clive will come up now and lead us through what our worship is our, in offering. Happy Sabbath, everybody. I had this whole long story that I was going to tell, but because of time, I'll save it for the next time I'm up here. Um, but I want to leave you with this verse. Those who are faithful in little are faithful in much. And I've seen God bless us as a family multiple times for just being faithful in the small things. So as we go into our um, offering period, I pray that you may be faithful in little so that God may bless you in much. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much um, for the opportunity to give. Lord, it's your... Um, your will for us to be faithful in the small things so that you can bless us in much. And I pray as we give that it may be from the heart and that you may multiply it to all the fantastic ministries that happen um, around the world. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Now we invite all our kids to head to the back and grab one of those cups and filter through for that offering. And Uncle Jim Pappas will have an amazing story for all of you up here at the front. kids are coming up if this is for the adults today's story comes from a book called God Still Lives 
It's written by Don McClafferty. And there's four or five copies in the library under the freebie pile. So sneak back there. If you like this story, sneak back there and grab these and tell them to your kids or for yourselves. God still lives. Good morning, children. How are you doing? Oh, what a good day. Some rain for, so the grass will grow and everybody be happy. I'm reading you a story from a book called God Still Lives by Don McClafferty, and he's going to be here next week, so you can ask him about this story and ask him the details. And this story comes from chapter 10 that says, Every Moment Matters. And he was on an airplane coming back from the Middle East. He'd been on the airplane for hours and hours and hours, and he was tired, and he's over the United States now, and only a few hundred miles from getting ready to land. And he had been talking to the stewardesses and the stewards and witnessing and praying with people and sharing copies of his book. And he'd made a lot of friends. And now they are getting ready to land. And uh, he went back to his seat. And over the loudspeaker says, the plane is now descending for its final descent into the airport. Please, everybody, go to your seats and buckle your seat belts. And that's when he went back to his seat and he sat down and he buckled his seat belt. And he was sitting there, a young man walked back, walked past one of the young stewards. And this man had been very professional and he'd given all the refreshments and he'd done everything he needed to do. But he hadn't been very friendly and he hadn't smiled at all. So uh, Don was, hadn't made friends with this young man. And so this young man walked back, going up to the front of the plane, and the Holy Spirit talked to Don, and he says, go talk to that man. And he says, well, Lord, I can't do that now because they told me to get in my seat and lock my seatbelt because we're, we're getting ready to land. I can't do that, Lord. And, <clears throat> and then the young man went up to the front. The young man went up to the front, and they have a little, uh, little curtain that you pull around yourself. So he went up to the front and pulled his curtain. So now he's on in, in his own little private office. And the Lord says, Don, go talk to this man. Now, I want to stop here with the story. You guys are old enough that you can listen to God's voice. And someday, God's going to tell you, go pray for this person. So Don was sitting there, and, and God said, Don, go talk to this man and tell him that I love him and ask if you could pray for him. And he goes, oh, Lord. And then the, on the loudspeaker, be sure your seatbelts are safe. And we are now in our final descent. We bring everybody who want to be safe. Anyway, they went through the announcement. And so he goes, oh, Lord, I can't go. And the Lord says, he said, Don, go right now. Tell that young man I love him and ask if you can pray for him. Do it now. Okay, so he unbuckled his seatbelt and he, excuse me, and, and, and he goes, excuse me, so, you know, gets all the people and he starts walking down the aisle toward the front and all the people are looking at him and they go, hey, you're supposed to be putting your belt on, not walking down the aisle. And, and he's walking toward the front and people are looking at him kind of funny and he's going, oh Lord, this is embarrassing, but this is important. So he goes up to the front and he gets there <clears throat> and he goes to the curtain and he goes, Shh, pulls the curtain aside. And the young man looks up and he's startled and he says, Sir, what are you doing here? You're supposed to be in your seat. We're in our final descent. And he says, I have something. And he says, No, no, sir. You need to go sit down. And this man is very firm. You need to go sit down. And Don says, I, I, I have to tell you, God told me to come and tell you that he loves you. And can I pray for you? And the young man, oh, he staggered back and his face went kind of white. And he goes, What? He said, I was just talking to God. And I says, God, are you there? If you're there, can you do something to tell me that you love me? And could you do something to show me that you're, because I don't even know if you're there anymore. So do something. And then here you come and you say, can I pray for you? And you tell me God loves me. He goes, wow, oh, yes, you can pray. And so he prayed for him and he prayed a very nice prayer. And then that after he's done praying, the young man had tears coming out of his eyes. He says, thank you, thank you very much. But sir, you really need to go sit down. And then he smiled. And then Don went back to his seat and sat down. Isn't that a good story? But God can do that with you. Can you believe that? Let's pray. Dear God, help these boys and girls and the moms and dads that are listening to know that they can pray and change people's lives. Amen. Okay, go sit down and let's listen to the rest of the program.
Our scripture for today is found in Luke 18, verse 14. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and all those who humble themselves will be exalted. worship our King. Grace. 
week and we hear the testimonies and stories and training from Pastor Don McLafferty. I pray Lord that you may impact us as a church and help us to depend on you more and make the foundation to be prayer. I pray to the Lord for all the wonderful ministries that are going on in our church, the ways we're trying to touch and impact the community, whether it be Bible study, friendship, whether it would be through food banks or the meals that we serve or the social clubs. 
I pray, dear Lord, that we may be the hands and feet to the community um, of Grass Valley and that we may make friendships that may impact a lifetime. I pray, dear Lord, that um, you may be with each and every one of us in our personal lives. We all have friends and family who are sick or who are going through difficulties. We're living in a sinful world and we, we can't run away from it. So we ask for courage and strength that you may help us to impact the people closest to us as well. I pray, dear Lord, that you may give us wisdom, give us the right words to say, the right things to speak. And I pray, dear Lord, that we may just be a witness to those all around us. You've given us an important message for these last days. And as time is wrapping up, as we see things happening around the world, we just ask for courage, for strength, and for your Holy Spirit. I pray, dear Lord, for um, the pastor as he's going to deliver a message to us. I pray you may speak through him, give him the words that they may not come from him, but you above, that we may be impacted and blessed. And I thank you for this Grass Valley uh, church family that we have. This bond is special, and I pray that you may continue to work through us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. The hymn we're going to play today is a prayer, and it says, Teach me, Father, what to say, how to pray. Teach me how to daily grow. Teach me not to reason why. Teach me that the time is short. Teach me how we may be one, like Father and the Son. And when all is overcome, I will be like Jesus. That I pray that this is, will be your prayer too.
Amen. Wow, it is just so, so exciting to see all the things happening in our church, from schools to social events to answers to prayer to Don McClafferty. And we are excited about Don McClafferty coming. I'm heading down on uh, Tuesday um, and to Bakersfield to see my mom, and then I'm picking Don up Thursday or Wednesday. And Wednesday night, the leadership, you're invited to pray. We're having a prayer meeting. And then Thursday uh, evening, the revival series begins for everyone. We need revival. Revival is a delicate uh, movement, almost not a dance, but in a way like a dance between God and his people. And there's something that can kill a revival, that can kill the spirit of fellowship, and that is judgment that produces offense. Have you ever felt judged? Have you ever felt less than? Have you ever felt someone's moral superiority looking down upon you? And it irks you. No? Oh, good, because I was going to finish the sermon and just go home right now, because if it's not an issue, it's not an issue, right? Wow, there is such a, we are like chickens. We know the pecking order, and we know who's pecking on us, and let's admit it, we peck on people below us, right? Peck back, you know, throw a little jab back at someone who throws a jab at you. We're kind of little, you know, fencers, little swordsmen people. Super pharisaical judgment hurts both the giver and the receiver of that condemnation. It undermines our fellowship, our unity, our bond of peace. And I believe that if you're going to follow Jesus and you're going to be going in the path of growth as a disciple, you have to figure out how to get along with people. You have to figure out how to get along with people. Sorry, introverts hermits. You can't follow a banker and not expect to go into a bank. You can't follow a doctor and expect, expect not to go into a hospital. And you can't follow Jesus and expect not to interact with his children. And if we're going to be a church that follows Jesus, that's a disciple of Jesus, we've got to learn how to get along with people. We have to learn how not to pharisaically judge and how not to be offended when people do pharisaically judge us. So today when we talk about judgment, I'm not talking about the hippie version, live and let live, because the, the Bible does call us to judge. And in some ways, judgment is awesome. When you all say to the, you know, the choir, wow, great job, choir. Those of you who are in the choir, doesn't it feel good? It's the condemnation part of judgment we don't like. Well, that's what we want to talk about today. The church in the Christian church in the world is known for judgment, and the world hates it, and they don't want to come in. It stinks. Let's learn today how to put on some deodorant and not stink. Father in heaven, please bless us as we look at the story of the Pharisee and the tax collector who go up before you to pray. Amen. To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down, had contempt, and ridiculed everyone else, Jesus told this parable. He said, two men went up to pray to the temple, a Pharisee and a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and said, God, oh, I thank you. I'm not like other men. I'm not a swindler. I'm honest in my business dealings. I'm not an evildoer. I really keep faithful to the standards that you've given your people. I'm not an adulterer. Definitely, women, you don't have to worry about me. I'm faithful to my wife. I'm not like that uh, tax collector over there. I pay all my tithes. I fast twice a week. But the, uh, the tax collector, he stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but he beat his chest and he said, God, have mercy on me. And then Jesus does the mic drop. 
I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Ladies and gentlemen, Jesus is a spiritual genius. And we're going to unpack today to see what he means by this story. First thing I want to tell you is a story about uh, Booker T. Washington. Booker T. Washington was the president of the Inst uh, Educational College uh, Tuskegee, Tuskegee. And uh, he was uh, just been elected to the president. He comes into town and he's walking through the elite part of the town when a very rich, wealthy woman yells at him and says, hey, hey, come here. Would you chop this wood and put it in a stack? I'll pay you for it. And here he is. He's not just a professor. He's the college president. And he says, yes, ma'am. And he goes and he chops the wood and he stacks it in her house. And the little girl, of the, the daughter of the, of the woman, recognized that, she, that he was this prestigious president. And he told, she told mom. And so she comes out profusely apologizing. I'm so sorry. I didn't realize who you were. And this is what he said. It's perfectly all right, madame. Occasionally, I enjoy a little manual labor. Besides, it's always a delight to do something for a friend. How humble, how non-offensive taking. The woman was so grateful for this gracious response that she worked hard in that town and she got donors for his college and it proved to be a rich friendship from then on. I'm telling you, this guy had something about the gospel figured out. Let's see what he had figured out. It says there that the Pharisee stood by himself. He's approaching God, and he's saying this beautiful prayer. And what does he present to God? His resume. The reason we are offended, the reason we give offense, is because we're really in tune with our chicken-pecking status resume. Our points count. And it does count. In real life, if you go to a, a, a soccer field and you say to the boys, I want to play, they're going to ask, are you any good? Can you run fast? And it makes sense in life. If you come to a group and you say, hey, I'd like to join your group, they're going to say, are you pulled together? Are you beneficial? If, you, if you're at work, they're going to want to know that you're a good worker. Like, we know this in this world. And we think that's how God works too. And so here he is. He gives his resume. And if you can imagine it, there's Simon Pharisee. And he's got his references, and he's got his language, his expertise. I am a devout Pharisee, deeply committed to the upholding of the traditions and the laws of our ancestors. And let me ask you, does God want us not to be an evildoer, an adulterer, a swindler? I want this guy as my neighbor. I want to go to his store, and I want to buy merchandise from him, because he's not going to cheat me. And I know that he's going to give a tenth of his money back to the community. This is a good guy. And he's fasting twice a week. He's getting clear-headed. He's making sure he's doing the right thing in life. I'm not going to have to worry about picking him up off the, you know, after he blows his money gambling. He's not going to do those crazy things. This is a good neighbor. And Jesus said, it's good that you tithe, but don't forget the weightier matters of the law. And so here he is. He comes before. He's got his resume. And then Jesus says, there's a tax collector, and the tax collector comes, and what's on his resume? I am a sinner. Have mercy on me. Apparently, this is the most righteous thing you can do. This is what will get you considered justified by God. It's to come, and not to say all the wonderful things you do, not to earn it, but just to simply appeal to God's mercy. I want to imagine, if you can imagine going back in Bible times with me, and there's, there's uh, two guys out there. There's a lot of guys out there, but you're noticing they're all working. They're all doing the little sky thing, and they're chopping the wheat, and they're putting it on the basket. And you can see uh, that maybe there's a, a new manager, and the manager comes out, and he's kind of looking at everybody's bushels, and he's saying, hey, you guys aren't doing as many bushels as you did yesterday. And, and just imagine the first guy going, 
well, hey, hey, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's extra hot out today, and, you know, uh, this, this, uh, this area, the, the, the plot that we're harvesting isn't as, uh, it's not as rich, it's not, the, the, it's not growing as much. Of course we're not going to have as much. Like, it's not my fault. Well, you better figure it out because the boss needs this done. And so the first guy is stressing out because it matters. But then you look at the second guy, and he's not bothered at all. He just keeps swiping. He's putting it on the, the, little, the little trailer there with the donkey on it. What is the difference? Why is one guy all worked up about act, being accused of being a bad worker and the other one isn't? And I'll tell you why. Because one is an employee and the other is the son. Sons don't get fired. But if you're an employee, yeah, I don't want to get fired. My relationship with the farm owner is I do the work and he gives me a paycheck. So the more points I have, the better he likes me, the more money I get. But the son, he's not worried about losing his job. He's living in the house with the farm owner. He's out there because he wants to help get the job done. He wants dad to have the, the work. He's going to inherit it someday. So many of us have not clued in that you are a son and a daughter of God. You are a son and daughter of the king. Lucy and Jonas were playing the other day. They had their little play money out. Lucy is uh, enjoying it. She's counting it. And she turns around, and little Jonas catches his little brother moment. He swipes the cash. He swipes the swill, and he heads into the next room. Don't take my money. Folks, we are like little children fighting over how much resume points you have and how many resume points I have. When in reality, the king has given us real money. The blood of Christ has purchased your salvation. You stand righteous before the king of heaven. Does it matter if someone thinks less of you? To Lucy and Jonas, play money really matters. But someday they're going to grow up and they're going to realize daddy's credit card is a whole lot better. <laughs> Tap into the credit card of the father. It's paid by the blood of Jesus. There is no limit to what you can get from that. But we are like this son. We come before the father and we want to serve. We're going to work it off. And so it says here, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Remember the story? This is the prodigal son. He comes back and he's like, I'm not worthy to be called your son. And he's not, man. He screwed up. He really screwed up. He told his dad, I wish you were dead. I just want the money. And he spent it all on prostitutes and on, on wine and fine dining. And he comes back penniless. He says, make me like one of your hired servants. And the dad will have none of it. The dad will have none of it. No way. Put a ring on his finger. When you get offended, when you morally judge someone, you're saying, I'm not a son, I'm a servant. Don't be a servant. Be a son, be a daughter. Now, this is really interesting. How do you become a son and a daughter? The tax collector says, God, have mercy on me. The word mercy is only used a few times. It's a very specific word. It's the same word that's used in Hebrews 8.5 when it says, Above the ark were the cherubim of the glory, overshadowing the atonement or the mercy seat. It's this spot right here where it all converges. The law of God beneath the Shekinah glory of the God, these two angels representing the two aspects of God that we can tap into. And he's really saying, he's not saying have mercy on me so I can get away with more stuff. He's saying, please atone. Please reconcile me. I am a miserable wretch. All right, now you know me. What does this remind you of? It reminds me of the tree of life. I love the tree of life story. Because here we have two angels with the Shekinah glory, and back at the tree of life, 
we have two angels, cherubim, again, very specific Hebrew word, only used three times in the Bible. This is one of the two times it's used. And we have that shining sword. So again, can you imagine, here it is, the tree of life represents salvation, it represents life, it represents peace and joy and, and fulfillment and, and a strong community who, who loves each other and it represents the Holy Spirit. It's like everything you could want is in the tree of life. But the problem is we've been kicked out of the garden because like Adam and Eve, we have this sin problem. We want to write the rules. Pharisees like to write rules. And we write the rules according to the character traits we have. What really matters, you know who really good people are? People that have six children. Because they are like real parents, you know? You see what I'm doing? I have six kids, right? I mean, you know, who really, you know who really has it together? You know, the young people, they don't have wisdom like us older people. But, you know, you got to be young enough. Young enough, you got energy. Like, you know, so you know, I see what I'm doing, I, how it natural it is to kind of put yourself right there. <laughs> I always laugh at the world because they're like, oh, Christians, they're such hypocrites. Well, there are hypocrites, too, out there in the world. I have felt judged by conservative people, and I felt judged by liberal people. So here it is, I want life and I can't get to it because there's these two angels that are blocking me. I write the rules and God's like, I can't give you the keys of the kingdom if you write the rules. You gotta accept my creator rules. So here's what I wanna walk you through. These two angels, now this is really kind of interesting. Right before this, God says, it is not good, man has become like one of us. And we always say, who's the us? Now, we Christians rightfully jump to the conclusion, this is the Trinity. But if you stay in the passage without bringing in Jesus and the Father, you see actually two aspects of God. You have Genesis 1, God, 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 creator, king. And then you have the Lord, teacher, father. It's this very intimate interaction between the Lord and and Adam and Eve. Here's my thought on this. I think each angel represents the way God interacts with us. We have the angel on the right hand. I think it represents truth and righteousness. I think the angel on the left hand represents that aspect of God where it's mercy and peace. It's one God. I'm not saying it's two gods. It's one God. But the Bible is so beautifully artistic in how it presents the two aspects. And these are the two ways we can approach God. Truth and righteousness or mercy and peace. The thief on the cross who mocks Jesus comes to God with truth. Hey, Jesus, you're, sit, you're dying on that cross. I'm dying here. You don't deserve to be there. I don't deserve to be there. Get us out of here. I want righteousness. I want what's done. I want what's right to be done. He does not get salvation. The repentant thief on the cross, he's like, I deserve to be on this cross. And he gets salvation. So if you could just imagine with me, oh, here's the verse, Psalms 85, 10. Mercy and truth are met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Now, this is a very powerful image for me. I'm going to share it with you. I'm doing a little, I'm, I, I'm taking a little license in how I picture this, so you can tell me, take it for what it's worth. I imagine I need that tree of life. I gotta have peace, I gotta have uh, love, joy. I, I, my life's a mess, I need the tree of life. I, it, it's like symbolically, like I walk up to it and I have two options. I can approach God with my pharisaical resume of all the good things I've done and tell him the truth about me and about how great I am, I can list my righteousness and that will get me nowhere. Because God's, that angel's gonna look at me that, and he's gonna say, you? I know the truth, I know what you've done. And that sword, what is that sword? You guys remember the sword? It stands in the middle and it rotates. It's, it's like it's hovering. Neither angel has it. But I almost imagine that when I come before that with pride in my heart, 
They're like that metal detector. Like that angel senses it. And that sword almost swings over to that angel of justice, of truth and mercy, and he just holds it out. And there's no way with that blazing sword I'm getting near the tree of life. Pride is a killer, a blocker of me getting past that angel. And rightfully so, because if God lets me into the tree of life, I'm so power hungry, I'm so self-centered, I will abuse life for my benefit. And that angel knows it. And if I'm not humble, phew. but I almost imagine that if I come and, I, and this time I have, I'm, I'm repentful and I'm like, Lord, I, I'm, I'm, I need help. It's almost like that sword swings over to the hand of the angel of mercy. It's almost like he lifts it up, and now I have access to the tree of life. Now, maybe that's a little too odd. You know, one angel gets it, one angel does it. Maybe they both hold it, and when I have humility, they lift it high for me to go under. But I am telling you, if you have pride and you are not humble, the kingdom of heaven is locked tighter than a gold vault. I tell you the truth, this man rather than the other went home justified. If you want salvation, you have to humble yourself. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. Oh God, you will not despise. The Pharisee despises people. He has contempt on people. And God will never have contempt on a humble heart, a contrite heart. He guides the humble in what is right. He teaches them his way. Man, I don't know about you. I know that for, for me, if I am allowed to be a dictator, I become unteachable, and I twist the rules of the game to benefit me. And God knows that. But if I'm humble and I'm teachable, then God can let me into the tree of life. He can give me power. You know, Cindy said it this morning. If we don't pray as a church, if you don't pray, you're not getting in tune with the Lord. You think he's going to give you miraculous power? He can't trust you. I can't give the keys of the car to Lucy and Jonas. Are you kidding me? They think they can handle it. Oh, yeah. If you're teachable. Now, think about this for every moment. If you're teachable... When people come up to you with their moral superiority, it doesn't bother you. You know why? Because maybe it's a moment for God to teach you something. Ellen White says, if pride and selfishness were laid aside, five minutes would remove most difficulties. If I'm humble by the cross, and, you, and, and, and I no longer want to be selfish. I want Jesus to be honored and glorified. And I don't care about my credit score. I don't care about my resume. I don't care. I, I, I'm good with the king. I'm good with my father. I'm teachable. I'm humble. Then yes, you are an answer to prayer. Let's work this out. Because when you and I as, have fellowship and we come in unity, Jesus shows up. Where two or three are gathered in my name in the Matthew 18 chapter of conflict, Jesus shows up. But you got to put pride, you got to put selfishness away. I love this story. <laughs> Dr. Mitchell was this pastor. He's, he's, he has a, a doctoral degree. He's really something. He's really somebody. And one of his members comes up to him and says to him, uh, starts telling him all his faults and all his preaching and how it's not good, it's not working out. And you know what his response is? If what you say is true, would you mind praying for me? That's the answer, folks. Someone comes up with you, moral superiority. Ah, I can't believe you're doing that. Don't you know what the Lord says? Well, come on. Who do you think you are? I know what you do. I see you over there. You know, you think you're so great. Blah, 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 blah. No, you just say, if what you say is true, would you please pray for me? Whoa, how can a Pharisee pray for someone else? You're pulling the Pharisee out of him. What you say is true. Would you mind praying for me? Whitfield and John Wesley were two of the most famous preachers in the 1700s. 
powerful preachers. People would travel miles to hear either one of them. But they had a little doctrinal dispute. They kind of kept it on the down low because they, they didn't want the ministry to be affected. Each other's one. They had that spirit. But one person knew, and they came up to Whitfield, George Whitfield. They said, oh, Mr. Whitfield, do you think you'll see John Wesley in heaven? And Whitfield responded, I fear not. I fear that he will be so close to the throne of heaven and we so far at a distance that we'll never catch a glimpse of him. That's an answer of humility. I love this picture. Alex, uh, Alex, Risk, Alex Haley wrote a book and he put, has this picture, something like this, hanging on his wall. It's a picture of a turtle on top of a fence post. And whenever he's tempted to think about how great he is and what he's done, he looks up that and he says, you know, that turtle had to have help to get up on the fence. And whenever I think of how great I am, I got to remember someone helped me accomplish what I've accomplished. That's the humility, right? That's the humbleness. This is one of my favorites. Sing Saudi, uh, no, Saudi Singh was a convert to Christianity in the early 1900s, and he went around preaching. Amazing story. Ended up in Europe, went on this tour. Crowd showed up, just enthralled with his preaching, and, 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 uh, and someone came up to him and said, is it really that good for you to have all this praise? You know, everyone's, you know, just singing your, your virtues. And this was his response. No, the donkey went into Jerusalem and they put garments on the ground before him. He was not proud. He knew it was not done to honor him, but for Jesus, who was sitting on his back. When people honor me, I know it is not me, but the Lord who is behind me. Isn't that a good way of looking at it? Folks, you and I are the turtles and we're the donkeys. Oh, to be Jesus, to be with Jesus, to be like Jesus, but to give him all the glory and the honor. The Apostle Paul would say, I am the least of all the apostles. I am the very least of all the saints. And then he would finally conclude, I am the foremost of sinners. I believe that God has a, a, a powerful blessings he wants to pour on us. And it's when we humble ourselves, it's when we see the humanity within that I can see the humanity in you. And then I can rightfully come to you. And that spirit, I can say, hey, I want to pray for you. I want to pray God helps you. If you're not humble and you're not teachable, the teacher, what's it say? The teacher shows up when the student is ready. If we humble ourselves in light of the cross, the repercussions of that is not only salvation, it's fellowship. It's fellowship. And when we have that clearly dialed in, when we're not proud, when we're not offended, when we're not judging other people in a pharisaical spot, but we just keep going back to, man, I am so glad I got Jesus. I sure need him. Then I believe God will pour out a blessing on us that is a profound gift. And that's where I want to be. Father in heaven, um, right now as we uh, just reflect on, on this message about this Pharisee who comes to you with his resume, he's excited about what he is, and he uses it, he looks down upon others. 
Lord, he has not tapped into you as a creator God. He's not tapped into you as a, a father. He's, he's approaching you in this contract relationship. Jesus, we don't want to do that as a church. And, and one more thing, Jesus. In just uh, five days, uh, Don McClafferty's coming, and Lord, he's going to walk us through a message on Elijah. He's going to call for revival. Jesus, we want to humble ourselves. We want to let all the pride, all the self-sufficiency, we want to let it go. Boy, it is so wonderful to let it let go. So Jesus, today in this quiet moment in our hearts as a church individually, we confess that we too have been Pharisees. And we humbly, Lord, offer that to you in light of the cross in preparation, Lord, for your revival to break out upon us in the next week. This is our prayer in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Hey, let's sing with Paul the famous words, Chief of Sinners Though I Be, Jesus Christ Died. Please stand with us. son and a daughter. Amen? All right, so turn to the person next to you and say, you're a son and a daughter of the king. God bless you.